Alright RM beers, I'm at the Hamburg Reptile Show here in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. So well, let's take you inside and see what they got going on. I got my mask. Tandem reptiles. Tandem. So they have some scaleless bull pythons here. They've been breeding a bunch. Saying they're not so bad, man, to keep, just like ours. So we have Dom from Tam Dom. Like Tamden. Tam Dom. Reptiles. And uh, I want to know more about this guy here. It's this little girl, actually. So we'll, what is that? So what we think it is, we're not 100% sure yet, but what I think's going on is similar to the ivory ball python when you add leopard, it seems to pull out a lot of the pattern. This girl here was produced um, in the pairing. She should be a super pastel, super fire, enchi bongo. And I think either the enchi or the bongo or the combination of the two is bringing out all the pattern with the super fire and what's making this. Originally we thought it could have been a, a chimera possibly, mm -hmm. um, but the more I've thought about it, I think that it's just something going on with those six genes put together that's given it that unique appearance. That's awesome, man. Really appreciate it, it's a beautiful snake. Thank you. All right. So one table, one little display, but every single animal here is fire. Crazy man. Got some good stuff. Of course, my camera's getting too close. Got this guy here. It's good man. Shame on? you didn't bring more. Yeah, I, that's all I had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny, as you walk by, there's like all these uh, tables with all these animals on it, but I stop at yours because every single bin is something crazy. So, uh, what made you get into recessive stuff and uh, red stripe stuff? I mean, is it, you know, you had a tip off or? Uh, just, um, I just make what I like. And I just always go in the direction of uh, what I enjoy for myself. And you know, I love the red stripe, I love the clown. Yeah. yeah. It's the way to go, man. It's awesome stuff. So good luck. Nice, thank you. Man. Morphs by design. Gotta check them out.
right guys i got mask beard so i got to show you around it was actually not that busy um there was a lot of cool animals hopefully you guys got to enjoy that and if you guys like this video hit that like button down below make sure you hit a subscribe and uh go watch herb house rock and i'll show you guys real quick what did i buy um i got a couple of bags of snakes here we we'll have to show you that later and then oh i don't know a few million dollars worth of cork bark so i bought a bunch of flats not a lot it's like five hopefully ryan likes them all right guys thanks and we'll see you on the next one anyway. so can you go through some 101 stuff with people that are um you know ball python people you're talking about you'd like to see blood pythons in in every collection maybe as well as tr what tracy was saying what are the differences you know with keeping blood pythons and you were starting to say about how you set them up, you know, when they're first born, but how often do you feed them? What temperatures, you know, what's too hot for them? And um, that the whole, the whole gambit real quick, if you want to run through it. Sure. I mean, uh, so uh, for me, as far as, uh, you know, baby production wise, when I get babies, um, I still, uh, again, I, I'll sex them right out of the egg. Um, and, and I find that easier. I mean, this is a, a trick that I've done um for a long time i just stumbled on it it works for me but i've got a big uh deep sink that i work with i got a bunch of them in the building but i've got a, a two compartment deep sink and so i pull everybody out of the egg box i throw them in one side of the sink and um <clears throat> i uh i take the sprayer out and i spray everybody off to get all the goop off get all the vermiculite perlite i still do old school incubation i don't have any of those cool little plastic trays or anything so my snakes have shit all over them when they come out so put them in one side of the sink, I spray them with the spray hose. Uh, and when you start spraying them, if you've ever seen any videos of like baby cobras uh, online, I mean, that's what they look like when you start spraying them. They'll start snapping at each other. They got their heads straight up in the air. They're snapping, their mouths are wide open. I mean, they're vicious looking little things uh, when, when you spray them like that. They, I mean, literally, they'll bite each other. They get, they get angry in there. Um, but I'll let them sit for about four or five minutes after that. And, uh, They'll settle down and then I reach in. And I mean, the best way I describe it to anybody is, you know, make very diligent movements, move in, grab the animal. And then the biggest thing with blood pythons, because they're heavy bodied, is you want to support as much of the entire body as possible. Um, so I do that and then I just move really slow um, and, 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 you know, pop the animals. Um, it's one of those, hey, I feel if you're still learning how to pop an animal, don't try it on a blood. It's going to be a bloody mess. Um, but I mean, if you know what you're doing, you're good at it. I can get in there and I can pop it in two seconds. A lot of times, really, um, males will get aggravated and agitated enough. They'll just, they'll throw their hemipenes out on their own. So you can tell sometimes I'll just pick them up and go up. Oh, that's a male. I don't even have to check. Um, anything else I'll double check, but, uh, and I'll separate them into males and females, um, and, and set them up just like a ball python clutch. I'll put them all in on some wet paper towels with, a with, a um, with a water bowl and I'll let them sit in there for seven to 10 days. And really, I, I can't say I've got a reason for that. It's just a ball python habit that swung over into that. But at the same time, most of the time, I've got a backlog of stuff needs to get done. I don't have tubs set up yet. I gotta go get Aspen. I gotta you know make stickers for the tubs, do all this. And so it gives me some time to set them up. There's no set timeline on when it happens, but it's sometime in the next seven to 10 days, I'll get them set up. Um, now, uh, talking to quite a few people that I have talked to at Bloods, I start feeding mine way earlier than most people. Um, I know some people that don't start, don't start offering first meals until they're six weeks old. Um, I still do mine like a ball python. I'm like, Hey, I'm gonna offer it 10 to 14 days. Um, if you eat, eat. if you don't, you don't. Um, I personally, um, and, and really, I guess it sounds like the business side of the house. Um, but I, I start pretty much all my bloods, all my balls, all my bullets, all that stuff on hopper mice. Why? Because I buy a lot of my rodents and mice are cheaper than rats. And at the end of the day, uh, you're feeding a certain uh, weight of meat to an animal. Hey, what's the cheapest meat that I can buy? So I start everything on mice. Um, <clears throat> most of the time, I don't have any issues with the blood starting them on mice. Uh, I did have one this year and I will get it occasionally. Uh, that won't eat it and, and it, it takes me every year I forget and it takes me four or five weeks to figure out Oh, probably wants a rat. I'll throw a rat in there and it'll eat a rat um, So some of them will start on rats. I know a lot of people start their bloods off on rats 
Um, but a lot of people, I, I mean, start them way later than me. And, and I, I don't mind starting early because I kind of know some of them will take a while. So I don't freak out if it doesn't eat uh, in three or four weeks. I know some ball python people, three or four week old hatchling hasn't eaten yet, probably freak out. Um, but a, a blood python, I'm, I have zero stress and I really don't get stressed until they're darn near eight weeks old if they haven't eaten anything yet. Um, but most of the time, so I, I set those guys up on, uh, on aspen bedding um, just because it's easy. And most of the time I've got 50 tubs already preset with aspen and deli cups. I'm using ARS hatchling uh, racks. So uh, it's an ARS rack. Um, set them up on aspen. Um, <clears throat> it's a personal preference, really. I probably would rather set them up on Cypress or uh, Cocoa Block or something like that. Uh, they will get in the water bowl. They will get in any water bowl you give them. Uh, they will wet the tub down. They like high humidity. And so the problem with Aspen is they make it a lot wetter than a ball python. So it'll get wet. It'll get moldy. You'll be changing it out. They make a mess in their tub. There's no way around that. Uh, but the other thing is, most of the time, if I'm setting up baby bloods uh, for sale, uh, I don't mind putting them on aspen because there's a chance that a decent amount of them are only going to make it to two months old before they're sold anyway. So no big deal. But, you know, after they start getting some size on them, I will start uh, switching them over to uh, to rats slowly, but still smaller rats. Um, and, and then, you know, two to three months old, I'll go ahead and switch them over to, to cocoa bedding just because when they start spilling water bowls and dumping it all over the place, that bedding is way more conducive to holding all that additional water and humidity. Um, but that's how I set my babies up. Typically, uh, I feed all my bloods pretty slow. I mean, uh, small meals, like I, it doesn't leave a bulge at all. Uh, probably something a little smaller than necessary for almost the first year. Um, at a typically somewhere around 10 months to a year is where I find that you need to move them up into something bigger. I'll move them up into a 28 quart tub that size, or, or I'm dumb. I got three of those racks. I love them, and I don't know what Freedom Breeder calls them, but uh, it's the rack that's the exact same footprint as the CB70, but there's four wide instead of three wide. Um, so something like that, or a 28 quart. I have some 28 quarts that I that I that I use, uh, but I'll move them up at about a year. Um, and then I don't feed them any more frequently. I still offer every seven days. Um, but I'll feed them, start feeding them something a little bit bigger. And typically I'm, I'm pretty much only offering rats at that point in time. At about a year old, I don't know that I've ever weighed one, um, but I would probably fathom a guess that there's somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand grams or so at a year old for me. Um, and, uh, and then generally somewhere probably around two to two and a half years old, um, they could go into a CB70. Um, I don't keep any of my adults in a CB70 and, and I don't remember to number or name for that tub either but i've got some old ars racks um that have got these big giant vision tubs in them um i don't they're they're like i know they can't fit through a 36 inch door the rack can't so it's like 42 inches deep uh they're about 12 or 13 inches tall and i think they're somewhere around 32 33 inches wide um so i put my adults in those um, I, I, a matter of fact, I'm getting close to running out of space, so I'm, I'm going to order uh, a, another Freedom Breeder rack, and it's what I have uh, all my Brazilian rainbows, my hog islands, and my uh, Colombian boas and stuff in, but it's that two-wide rack. Uh, so it's similar to those blood racks, but they're not quite as tall. Almost the same floor space, not quite as deep. They're like 36 or something like that, maybe deep or 34, so you can get it through the 36-inch door. And, they're like 30 inches wide, but they're only like seven or eight inches tall. Uh, I'm getting one of those to put some bloods in as well. And I think they'll keep in there, most of them, unless they're really big. Some of my big animals, I'll still keep in those big tubs. Um, but so somewhere probably around two, two and a half years, I'll move them up into, into that tub. Uh, once I put them in that big tub, I actually have, it's a vision tub, and I don't remember the name of that one, but it's about 20 quarts. And that's actually what I use for a water bowl. Uh, so it's a tub in the tub and um, they'll get in that water and they'll stay in that water for days on end sometimes. So the only problem with that is it's a little bit of a pain because they like to get in the water. It's good for them. Um, they enjoy it. They like it. But uh, I find I have to change the water twice a week because they get in it, they get out, they poo in it, they pee in it. And if they shed in it, it's a mess. They get it dirty. The water gets funky. So I'm changing the water a little more frequently. They like it. 
Um, the adults, I keep on indented craft paper just because it's easier in those big tubs to keep the paper in there. Um, you know, they get it a little bit wet, um, but it's paper, so it won't mildew. It just dries out. I'll crack the tub if it's starting to get a little humid in there. But, you know, the beauty with blood pythons that people that haven't kept them don't know is their metabolism is a lot slower than a ball python. Um, so most of them are only going to poo uh, every six, eight, ten weeks. So, I mean, they don't make a big mess uh, frequently. They make a big mess when they make a mess. It's giant. Um, but they don't do it every week, so you're not having to clean a ton. I mean, I'll have some of my adult bloods will. You know, all I got to do is change water and put new paper because the paper's funky, but it's not because there's anything in there waste to clean up. I mean, they'll do that for a long time. But um, typically the babies, again, you know, I'm still feeding something small every seven days. Um, you know, sub adults uh, feeding something larger to start packing size on them every seven days. Uh, and then my adults, most of the time, uh, my males are getting fed every three weeks. Um, maybe I'll feed them sometimes every week or every two weeks if I've got something that's smaller. But if I have jumbo rats, then, you know, they get one jumbo every three weeks and they're perfectly fine. Um, the funny thing with the bloods is um, you actually want them to have a slightly pointed spine uh, on them because of the way they carry their weight. So, you know, people that are used to ball pythons will see that and think you're underfeeding it. Um, but it, it, it's just it's a different body shape and a different body style. So. Um, you know, I, I do, they do have a little bit of a pointed spine. If you can't see the spine and it's really round, that animal is, is very obese. And uh, I think obesity, especially in females, when well, males in any species, it just causes a lazy breeder. Uh, but in females, uh, matter of fact, I'm talking to Tracy one day, she was the one explain to me why she thinks it causes such an issue for egg development is, um, you know, that fat store happens to be. Uh, in the same portion of the body all your oviducts are, and that fat store may actually restrict the oviducts from expanding or the eggs from expanding. There's just not enough room in there for them to develop, and you end up with a bunch of slugs, uh, even though they had the fat stores to do it. So um, once my females lay eggs, I will feed them pretty large rats, large to jumbo rats every week for six, eight weeks to really get some size back on them. I just find that unlike a ball python, they seem to really empty themselves more. Uh, when the bloods are done spitting out a clutch, I mean, they look like skin's falling off. I mean, they look like they're about to die, some of them. Uh, so I, I don't mind getting some weight in there. But once they get weight back on, they fill out a little bit, they look good, then I'm, I'm back to, you know, every two weeks, but normally every three, uh, feeding them a good-sized meal uh, on those. From a temperature perspective, um, the fortunately, this year I've got a whole rack that's got a bunch of boas, and I'm keeping the boas a little cooler than the balls. So it's not as big a deal. But normally I keep the blood pythons at the bottom of the rack close to the floor so they can be as cool as possible in that rack. Um, but I, adults specifically and then any of my sub-adults that are in racks all are on their own. Um, my building pretty much stays somewhere around 82, 83 degrees pretty much year round. It may dip a little bit in the winter sometimes. Um, but 82, 83, so that would be their cool end. And then I offer them 86 to 87 on the hot end and, and that's it. Um, so to me, really anything more than 88, um, you're probably starting to get into a territory where you may have some problems with them eating. They're going to dump their water all the time. They're going to be a little bit more agitated, a little bit more aggressive. You get in the tub, they're really mean. And you find a ton of people that are like that, that end up with, um, you know, animals that are, that are, uh, <laughs> sorry about, sorry about that. Uh, animals that, that get hot. <laughs> I don't, I don't know over there. My daughter and her fiance, and I don't know who the other dude was. They're probably going to look at something or other. My daughter breeds doobia roaches as well. They're in, they stay in my building, so I don't know if they're going to look at roaches or snakes or who knows what. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's how I keep the bloods. Uh, that's how I set them up. And again, it's just you know they're gonna they're gonna take a while to shed, and uh, if they take a little while to, to get started eating, don't stress that's the big thing with with the bloods but someone coming into the game you're a little ways away from breeding so um you know just make sure you're buying an animal that's feeding well and if someone's selling you an animal that has already started feeding and feeding well you're not going to have a problem blood pythons rarely miss a meal um the only other thing i really tell anybody about a blood python is it, it, they they seem to um, you know, I tell anybody to ask about snakes and specifically when I get the, the question about, hey, you know, is a snake, can a, will a snake bite me? I say, I mean, look, a snake really is, is really only got, you know, it's, it's like a light switch in their brain. 
Um, and they got three of them. You know, one of them is survival if they're getting attacked, and one of them is procreation, and one of them is feeding. And so the switch is either on or it's off. It's not a rheostat, so there's no medium setting. Um, but the bloods, their switch seems to be a little stiffer. If you ever hit a light switch that's really stiff to switch, so when that food switch comes on, it's on. So, I mean, I tell everybody, if you feed your blood python, get in there, feed it, get out, leave it alone. Um, I've taken three very bad bites from a blood. Um, all three of them were my fault. All three of them were on feeding day. All three of them were on feeding day, checking on the animal after it had already eaten. Um, so, you know, that switch is still on. They just ate a big jumbo rat. I know they're full and they wanted more. And I mean, I've taken three really nasty bites from large adult females, uh, from that. And they, unlike the ball python, they will hold on. Uh, and it does hurt like hell. So, uh, <laughs> to me, I say, Hey, feeding day, the, the food switch is on, just, you know, feed them, leave them alone. Don't go play them with them. Um, and, and outside of that, I, I mean, I've, I've never, you know, no other really, crazy things with them is, you know, they like a little bit more humidity. They like it a little bit cooler. And, um, you know, they, if, if anyone's got any experience with some larger animals, I mean, the other thing, I, I think part of why they get a little bit more aggressive and, and testing as well is I think they're a little bit smarter, but they're definitely more attentive. If you hold a blood python and you really watch its eyes, you'll see its pupils moving around like a, like a person. Uh, like a dog, you know, a ball python just sits there. You can't really tell it's doing anything, but they're looking at everything around them, all of their surroundings. Uh, and so they're taking that in. And so the other big thing is, you know, people want to hold a blood python at a show. And then I tell them, hey, if, if you really want to hold it, then I'm going to bring you behind my table. Because if I let you hold it out on the other side of the table, what happens is people start coming around. They start moving their hands like this. doing, And that's when that animal starts striking. They don't like a lot of peripheral movements. They don't like a lot of fast movements. Um, even occasionally, if I grab one of the blood pythons and I'm walking through the building, I'm going to go weigh it. I'm going to go take a picture. If I go through a doorway or I'm walking, it'll just strike for no reason in midair. And it's probably because you walk by a rack. And so it looks like movement because it's moving, not the rack. But stuff's going by the eye and they just don't like that. So they don't like all that movement stuff. So that comes in with the diligent movements. Reach in, pick the animal up, and then, you know, try to – Try to handle it by yourself or with someone else that understands, you know, how that animal is going to react. So they're not moving around a lot. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, great species. But that, that's kind of how I kept them and some of the learnings that I've come across over the last 10 years or so messing with them. That was that was very complete. <laughs> very, that was very good. Tim, I, I had like questions and you throughout it. Answered them all. Oh, that, that's hot. Incubation wise.